advertised on the wall. It's not the end, but the beginning of our, our time together. <laughs> I'm excited to be here in, in out of the rain and in this nice auditorium. It's more beautiful than I expected. And it's really great to be back here again. I haven't been here in many years. I came uh, to the museum maybe a decade ago for several years with my family. It's really nice to be back again and see the Abenaki being honored, uh, the heritage of the Abenaki being honored. Um, I think while we are a people, it is those things that are unique in our culture that are most important and most celebrated on a day like this. And uh, I don't think the two can be separated. I think they're <laughs> integral to each parts of the culture that my family has been very involved in maintaining. Our first traditional stories, uh, which I was lucky enough to hear from my father, Joseph Bruchak, whose books I have many, although that aren't wet, we've done our best to keep them dry for you <laughs> under a tent. And then uh, the language, as well as some music. And I think all those things come together. All these things are related. And there are so many other parts of the, the culture, traditions, and ceremonies um, that are being preserved by other people here. Crafts that are being preserved, things, new things that are being created. Uh, Native people aren't just something of the past. There's new styles of art. There are new stories. There are even new patterns and ways to speak. I guess I'm a uh, kind of a linguist. I work with languages. I don't just work with the Abenaki. I'll probably pronounce it Abenaki, just because I'm accustomed to that. It's a habit. But I've been lucky enough to work with many related Eastern Algonquian languages. And recognizing, as we see among those that are spoken by many people still, like the Anishinaabe, or sometimes called Ojibwe or Chippewa, where you have over 100,000 speakers, that the language is rapidly changing and growing. As new concepts come into their communities, people have to develop new words for those concepts. But at the same time, children find new ways that they'd like to speak, just like our, our children find new ways to speak English. Uh, sometimes we don't necessarily embrace them. Are, are we aren't too excited about them. And I hear that argument from friends of mine who are members of communities like the Mi'kmaq, who also have a lot of speakers and see changes happening in their languages. It's a sign, though, that we have to realize that the languages are then living things, just like any tradition. When it lives, it grows, and it changes. And I'm often and we're often relegated to look at Native people and say, it has to be this way, because that's the way it was written in 1652. Or it has to be this way, because that's the way I saw the image being drawn back then. That what makes languages and what makes cultures alive is that they're continuing to grow and at the same time being fully informed as best as we possibly can by what we're able to gather and know about ourselves today um, and about our ancestors from the past. I feel really, really lucky to be here among family and friends supported by the people that are here and excited about all the work that they're doing because none of us can do it alone. So it's great to see people doing so many other things. I'm going to mention, mention that I'm going to share a little music. I'd like to share a story to begin. And as I share the story, I'm going to do it both in the Abenaki language and the old way so you can hear that language. My language is far from perfect. I'm still working to become more fluent every day. I teach the language. As I said, I teach other dialects. Um, of Eastern Algonquian languages, and in them I learn, and I feel like I've become a stronger speaker, but at the same time, there's an adage that says, the more you know, the more you realize you, you know nothing at all. And it feels like every time I learn a new level about the languages, the more I realize, wow, you know, I have so much still to learn. So I'll just do my best and, uh, and just say, as I know Hopi and other people who would make beautiful pieces of art, sometimes would intentionally make a mistake because they know only the creator was perfect. And if we weren't to compete with him, I'm not going to make mistakes on purpose. I'm just going to, they're going to be there. So forgive me for this. As I begin, this story that talks about the coming, as I know it, of the, the instrument that I'm holding in my hand, Pequongan. Pequa is something which is blown through. Ongan means it's a tool. And the language of Pequongan is that thing which is blown through. And it said that long ago, the people didn't have the people are gone. As I tell the story, as I learned from my father, and it has been done in the Northeast among Native people for many hundreds, if not thousands of years, I'd like to make sure you're a part of the story. 
not falling asleep. It's nice and warm in here after coming in from the rain, not wandering off in your mind, but instead really fully a part of the story and what's being shared. I'll say ho, and when I say ho, I'd like you all to say together in one voice, hey. Ho? Hey. We've got everybody's listening. And there's four things we do within traditional Native communities before we had universities and schools of any kind, Adala Kidimek, places of learning. Before those places existed, people had to learn using four steps that uh, another Eastern Algonquian people just carried on this tradition. Uh, the people called the Mohegan. Carol Tantaquidgen was an elder I was able to meet as a child. Um, Lattice Tantaquidgen as well, and my father spent a lot of time with them in their Indian Museum down in Connecticut. And on the wall, there was a circle. And on that circle, there were four points on the circle. And, and Harold Cantabridge said it was a circle of knowledge how our people passed all of our things that we knew from one generation to the next, our language, our stories, our culture, by doing four things. And the first thing to come into that circle of knowledge was just to open up our ears and listen. Hope. Hey. And the second thing we have to do is open our eyes and observe. Oh. Hey. And the third thing we have to do, maybe we have to hear a story many times, maybe we have to hear a song many times, maybe we have to see something done many times, maybe we have to experience something many times before we get to the third step, which is to remember it. Once we've remembered something, we then have a responsibility to make it into a circle. It was a circle on the wall, and to listen and observe and remember things, we gain them for ourselves, and that's great, but that's a straight line as a beginning and an end, and we want this to circle around, so the fourth step is to share. So that's what brings me here today, and it enables you to hear um, and observe and hopefully remember a bit and then do the same, share with others. Oh? Hey. So long ago, Agua, it is said, Agua, that long ago, right away, as I begin the story, I'm not just speaking another language, I'm speaking a language in a different way. It's important to realize that when we learn another language, we're not just learning replacements for words we know, we're learning other ways to see the world and other ways to think. And when we speak of the past in an Eastern Algonquin, when I speak of Eastern Algonquin, I'm talking about from Virginia all the way up to Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, um, the entire East Coast, people would preface things that were not experienced by them with the term like agua, which means it is said. And that informs the audience that I didn't experience this. The entire gospel and Bible that were recorded in Algonquian languages always had this agua in them. It means it is said or it's been reported to me. And throughout that story, a different form of the past tense is used. Not to get too into the linguistic stuff, but the conjugation of verbs for reported events is totally different than that for ones that you have experienced. That concept doesn't exist at all in English. We just say that God did this. And, and, and it's almost as if, did you see it? Right, whereas in Algonquin traditional stories, and as I said, even in the retellings of the Bible and Gospel, we would say, it is said that and there's a little ending on the verb. Instead of a past tense marker, there's a sound like za, and that, again, says that it may have happened, but I didn't necessarily see it. And this opens up a whole world of beauty within storytelling. It allows things to happen that are marvelous and not be questioned, like animals talk, and people make themselves like into mountains, and all kinds of miraculous things happen because this is the way this information was reported to me. So as I begin my story, I say, Agua, it is told. And you know we've entered into a different type of language. Agua no wa nongoniwi, tazugo sanoba, kazalmo kedak hano. Kanwa agama onda ukizi, niskamo inao, kluzo onganao, tani adodzi u nami hon agama. Long ago, it is said. There was a young man and he'd fallen in love with a young woman. Every time he saw her, he couldn't find any words at all. He had no words. Oh? Hey. The only thing he could say was, ah, ah, ah. He 
just stuttered. He, he, he choked. He couldn't speak at all. Kanwa agama ulawongan kisi hila. Ta uhaga kisakda. But his heart would beat fast and his body would get warm. Agama kizalmo. He was in love. Kizalma wongan. He is is a sound we've heard several times. Kiss he flies fast. Kiz. He becoming. Kiz. And then kiz abda. Kiz. And abda is about the heat. It becomes hot. Kiz. Kiz zalmo or kiz alma wongan is love. It's amazing to see that that root within the language rep represents speed, heat, and love. That one root sound. And Algonquin languages are bringing many parts of uh, what we call little pieces, maybe, and piecing them together. It's called a polysynthetic language or agglutinative. And that one sound, that root sound, doesn't just have one meaning. There aren't that many root sounds. There are a few hundred root sounds. But in context, their meaning can change. And in the placement within words, their meaning can change. But to know that keys can mean fast, that kids can mean hot, and the kids can mean love. It's kind of cool. kind of makes sense if you think about it. Oh, hey. And because of that, Agama and Dao was an inclusive home now. He had no words. Agama to be the home soul. Ta, losa, nodo daida, taka, okumasa, we go mac. So he thought, to be the home soul, he, he uh, measured in his mind, to be the home soul. And he went to do something that was traditionally, went to visit his elder, Okamasa, his grandmother. In a word you all know, Wigwomak. She lived inside of a Wigwom. Wigwomak, an Algonquin word, uh, an Abenaki word. He went to visit his grandmother, Okamasa, and her Wigwomak. Ta, na dodama wa za agama. Tani in kizi kluzi spiwi na pahano. So grandmother, I can't find any words when I see her, but I love her so much. Can you help me? Please, please, Liu Lao Damana, can you help? Oh, okay. Hey. And his grandmother, Agama Okamasa Ida Kizila, Kidachui Alosa Alomiwi Kapiwi, Ta Ibita Honda Vinidami. Perhaps you need to go into the forest and have a sit. Now the idea of a sit, um da vi, uh, like uh, you go and you sit, you listen, comes out in culture. We hear about like the Native American vision quest. It's not fictional, it's true. It's important to go into the woods. The woods is an important place. Mountains were important places where people would go to find visions. Um, they put themselves through some kind of a trial. In this case, he heard the words of his mother, he knew exactly what to do. He went into not just Kapiwi, the woods, but Pizawakami Go, the deep, dark forest. Agama Udulosa Alongwi Pizawakami Go, Ta U Kuilovato, Dali Udzi Abi. He went into the forest and he searched around for a good place to sit. Oh, hey. But he couldn't find it. Oh, hey. He searched more. Oh, hey. Tamina, Until he was exhausted. Alada um, molondaks. He noticed a molondax, a red cedar tree. Uli monguzu. It smelled so good. Ta alado pombin atsi kitsisen. And he noticed a great big stone. Kizos, kizoso, kizosek nidali. Tani sen kizabda. That stone had been sitting with the sun shining right down on it, and it was warm smelled nice in that spot. It was a warm place. So he, he ondabi, like his grandmother said, he sat down. Oh, uh, he rested and he leaned his back on that rock and prepared himself for his vision. Kanwa agama usomi usalto. 
את הפזידה בכלל. סיבולק וסור ומגן טאון לאוויור. I wish I could whistle that. So he was so tired that when he sat down and leaned up against that hot, that warm rock, the sun was setting that key point in the west, and he fell sound asleep. And he began to tsibulakwa so wongan, a word that literally translates, or I would say is meant to mean snore. Tsibulakwa so wongan. But it literally is tsigual. Anybody know what tsigual is? I have speakers in here. Tsigual. Yes, tsigual. Idamuo. Um, frog. So he was frog something. <laughs> Ikuso, kikuso is a whistle. So sigulakuso, wongan means it's an action, something he was doing. He was frog whistling. And that's to snore. He was snoring. <laughs> Beautiful. So again, it's not just. Snoring, I didn't just say snoring in event, I guess it's a totally different concept. And the way that people heard it was it sounded like those frogs and whistle. Oh, well, he heard that frog whistling. Luckily, um, he heard something else. Ulalamegwongan, Agama no damawa kagui atsi. He heard something else as well. Taolawi natami agama ulada ni ali tongwa taolawi sipsa kama u no da omi na ta alada omi ni ali tongwa taolawi ikuso kama agama ulawa ngan kila tauhaga kisa ta taolawi tami adozi u nami hona hano. Come on, Dixie, the Wipita, the Ivita, the Bestawa, me on Sagi Tongwat. Oh? Hey. Yeah, he, he started to hear something in his Ligua Suangan, in his dream. Ligua Suangan comes from some roots that have similar Lugonsa, the root of Ligua Suangan. I don't know that it's the same. It means sleep. Gawi is in there. But Lugonsa and Ligua Suangan are so similar, and Lugonsa means to weave. And I like to believe that somewhere in dream, in dreaming, there's that root for the idea of weaving. Something was being woven, perhaps, together in his mind as he dreamed, and he took and he snored. He began to hear something. Ali, how tom? It sounded the way that it sounded. Ali tomba, taolawi sipsa, a bit like the birds. Taolawi kizilom sin, a bit like the wind. Although we keep with so, it's like a whistling. And he listened closely to that sound as he slept. And as he listened to that sound, his heart, his ifa, the lamongan, his ifa, went fast. Tahutaga, his body, kizabda, became warm. Agama. Mikwal Dam, he was reminded of that woman that he loved. As he heard that Onsagi Tongwa, that strange new sound. Ibita u no da wa. He just listened to it. And he felt like he did when he saw that woman. Oh? He was excited but he was also snoring really loudly. Perhaps a little too loud. So loud that when he did one of those big he woke, him, woke himself right up. Oh, and I, you know how to say, um, you know how to say wigwam in Abenaki. Does anybody know how to say moose in Abenaki? Moose. Very good. It's a loan word that, that in English we're now speaking. We, we speak a lot of words that come from Eastern Algonquian languages, from Jamestown, um, as people were learning them from the uh, Powhatan speaking people, like the Pamunkey, Appomattox, Chickahominy, and others, all the way up the East Coast, especially, of course, in Massachusetts, uh, where we had the pilgrims landing. And the English were the ones who were learning these words. And so we still speak English today. It's a primary language in the US. Those loan words have remained. Moose is one of them. Uh, 
Another one is caribou. Another one is chickadee. Another one is chipmunk. Another one is tomahawk. I could go on and on. Hundreds of words that we speak every day for nouns, for things that we see, but also even for actions. Uh, like the story, um, it needs to move along. And to say move along, I'd say mosey. Everybody, if you look in the dictionary, Webster's Dictionary, it'll say Eastern Algonquin origin when we look at the word mosey. And that fact means to move. Oh, okay. Hey. Well, things had changed for him because he'd just woken himself up from his dream and his mind began to change. Hila means changing. Literally, it means becoming. Moose means something like strange. The moose is a strange creature. Uh, my friend Aaron York has a moose who's old today with him, a moose nose. You get a chance to, to visit him. Uh, that moose was a strange concept to people. You'd see moose, there's lots of stories about moose, a giant monster moose, all types of things, moose trying to fight the people. Moose had to be changed because he wanted to destroy the people. Well, the idea of moose qual da hila, hila means changing, qual da means in your mind. Changing in your mind to strangeness is a verb now, moose qual da hila, and it means anger. So the root for anger has something to do with your mind becoming twisted or strange. And he had woken himself up from that dream. He was so excited about that sound he heard that when he woke himself up, he got Muskwalda. He laughed. He became angry. Muskwalda. He was upset. Oh? Hey. He had a chance. He was being gifted some kind of vision in his dream, and he just ruined it with his Tsugulako Solongan with all his snoring. <laughs> he was so upset that he almost didn't notice that sound, that little sagi tongwat that he heard had followed him right out of his dream. And it was still going on in the forest. And Pizuwa Kami Go. That sound. And he did what Harold Tantaquijan, uh, what he and Elder talked about. He did the right thing. He realized to gain knowledge, he needed to stop and listen. And he stopped being so angry, and he just opened up his ears and listened and realized he could still hear that same sound. It was still with him. Oh, hey. and he also started to observe. He started to look around because it wasn't always happening. The sound would happen and then it would end. And he realized that every time Kizi Long Sin would, the wind would blow. That sound would come. And he also looked around and noticed where that sound was coming from. That beautiful Molong docks that red cedar tree that he sat down beneath. He looked up it from where that sound was coming. He noticed there was a Beska Ontquen, a branch. And that Beska Ontquen was, was Matsina. It was dead. And it was probably hollowed out. It looked, it looked like a woodpecker. Well, Bastas had knocked holes in it. Whenever Kizi Lomsen, the wind would blow, it would make that sound. He figured it out. Oh, hey. he gave thanks to that tree and reached up and posted him in the Beskamont, but he broke the branch off the tree. And he had in his hand something brand new. He had that very first flute. And he wasn't good at it right away. He had to work with it. He had to get to know it. Um, and he had to he eventually realize the most important thing that he needed to add, because that wind was gone, was the breath that we're all sharing now, a circle of breath that we all share. And he blew directly into that flute. And he practiced that flute. As he did, he thought of that woman. Oh. Hey. He continued to practice. And I, I get an opportunity, and I know many of us um, get opportunities. We all can be teachers. We have opportunities to teach. And, one thing I've learned is that everything I've learned and I've gotten good at, it's because I've stuck to it. And I've continued to work at it. And I, I don't, you know, I didn't just I didn't just know how to play a flute. I had to practice. And if you love it and you're passionate about it, the language, if you want to speak the language, just find a passion. If that's your passion and you stick to it, uh, you can get it. You can get anything. And that young man, he was so in love, that love drove him. 
and he needed a way to communicate, so he just kept practicing and practicing and practicing until he felt like he had finally made something that could communicate his message. And he went back to that wigwam. He went to the wigwam of that young woman, and he stood outside of it, and he began to play that song for her. Oh, hey. hey. something new and then sharing it with her that they they became uh, they were married is a term that means equally wife and husband they were married together and had children and there is a tradition I don't have another instrument with me so I'll just do an acapella I'd like to share another song with you there's a tradition that still exists among some, some native communities and existed among Algonquian people of proposing marriage with different styles of flute. Um, not necessarily the flute that I played here. There were flutes made of reeds, flutes made of bone, flutes made of stone. All types of flutes would be made, but songs would be created on them to propose marriage. Um, instead of going out and buying a ring uh, for engagement, a, a song would be written by a young man for a young woman. The melody that was created on that instrument, on that pikongan, on that flute or whistle, she could then, she basically took ownership of it. In fact, women took ownership, or Ari didn't take ownership, they had ownership over much of those things, although ownership, the idea of it was different. Um, it was a woman's home. It was the land that the women worked uh, that was, uh, it provided much of their, much of what people lived off of, the corn, the squash, the beans. These were all things that the woman, the women of communities controlled. So for a young man, he was really asking for acceptance into her world, into her, we might term it, clan. Um, the baby would go, and they would go and live in her village. And that song would be one that she would take. That melody, she could put words to it and sing it as a lullaby. So there are lots and lots of lullabies. This is one that I heard at the American Philosophical Society. I was down there in the early uh, 2000s with a group from Indian Island and um, different communities up into Maine, Passamaquoddy, Penobscot, and one of them was a Penobscot lullaby. And as we listened to it, I was like, whoa, you can really hear the flute melody in that song. And it was sung by a woman, about 1910 or so, on a wax cylinder. It's since been digitized, and I, there's a beautiful rendition of it on YouTube if you look up the Penobscot lullaby uh, being sung by a Penobscot woman in modern times. And I'd like to just sing my version of it, a uh, beautiful singer is that, just to emphasize the idea that as we hear this lullaby, as there are many, many other lullabies that, that exist that have survived, it was once played by a young man for a young woman on his uh, flute or whistle in a proposal of marriage. And the words added to it are simply saying, sleep well, little child, sleep well. I I don't 
books from that period, uh, I think it published about 1978 or so, called uh, The Wind Eagle and the Faithful Hunter, and they're a collection of Abenaki and Penobscot stories. And my father also traveled with me to visit Wayne Newell, uh, who was a passable body speaker. So I got to hear when I was little, when I was like four, five, six years old, and I planted a seed. Uh, we named our family pets in the, in the language, as I know many people here experience this. We get a little bit of our language from our family and in our usage in our home, but I was never exposed or able to speak it in my home. My father was not a speaker, he was uh, learning, um, and I was just happened to be there by his side. So when I was 20, I heard about a language tape by Gordon Day, uh, and I got a hold of it, and I put it, we put on a still tape cassette, and I just listened to it all the time. I loved it. And I heard about classes up in Swan, Vermont, and I went up to those. And first took my first lesson was Cecile Wallen Olette in 1992. And about the second class, I was I had a computer, and the second class she came over. And she said, "Is the language in that computer?" She was 88 at the time, a fluent speaker, also from the community, uh, community of Odenac in Quebec, uh, where the language survived. And I said, yeah, the language is in the computer. I'm writing everything you're saying down. She's, she's like, that's, that's really cool. Will you help me you know, in the next classes? And I quickly kind of became a little bit of a helper to her. And I was able to help organize the lessons and ended up moving up to Swan because I wanted to be closer. And I lived some time up at Odenac as well with her and with others. And I studied the language for about a decade like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I knew during that period, maybe 30 or 40 speakers some um, you know, living in different parts of Albany, New York. Some people spread up through, uh, there were some in Lake George, and a lot at Odenac. Every single one of them that I visited and I got to, the chance to speak with, uh, made some recordings when I could. Uh, and you know, I just felt like as everyone passed, that it was that much more important for me to continue to learn. Most recently, like having my, having a, I have a 10-year-old and a 12-year-old, so 10 years ago my son and, uh, and daughter came into the world 12 years ago, I started to talk to them. And I'd already been teaching and learning for almost a decade and a half at that point, and the language was so much better because I had kids so in home. I had a captive audience, so they, were, they had no choice. She, she'd say something in English to me, I'd immediately say it back in a batting and if I didn't know how to say it back, I'd look it up. And I was just always kind of mimicking her with the Abenaki words. So that helped me a lot. And um, it's still a journey. I'm still learning. I can speak fairly well, but I have a lot to learn. And my journey continues. So it's just a journey that I've been on for almost since 1992, really. Uh, 
really exciting to work with my team. So it, it, it continues, and it's exciting to have opportunities where other people, you know, now can I can help other people. So that's a good question. Well, thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Sharing all this with us. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's great. I, I found one of the really cool ways for my kids. I know, and for me, is almost every night when I have, you know, when I'm with them, they they insist on having a story, and I do the stories in Indian, and I don't translate them ever, and they know them. So they they they're growing up. I couldn't do that, but they're growing up knowing our traditional stories only in India. And then later realizing, oh wait, these are in English too. And it's like, yeah. And they're getting them. And how they get them is pretty amazing because a lot of the words that I use, I don't remember even at this point teaching them. They just get them based on the context, which is the best way to learn. And I, I wish I had that opportunity more. And so it's nice to provide it to them and then to work with others um, somewhere in the audience with the language as much as possible. Yeah. Would you tell in English specifically? Yeah. One of the early stories your father collected. One of your favorites. One of my favorite stories that he collected. <laughs> um, an early story that he collected. Yeah, I mentioned it in this story. It's kind of a fun one. Uh, they say that uh, that long ago. This is when I remember him telling me as a kid. So he would come into my room and tell me stories. And he says in the front of the Faithful Eagle and the Wind Eagle, uh, the Faithful Hundred and the Wind Eagle, that he would test the stories out on his kids. So I, I kind of stole that and used it with the language of my kids. Uh, but he would tell us stories. And one my brother and I always loved was he talks about a culture girl named Blue Scotty, who was one who created himself. He shaped himself and he's spoken of as Blue Scott, Blue Scomba. To look at the, the language first is to say, in Abenaki, I would say I'm an Almomba, which means a common person. A talking person would be a Gluskomba. So we hear the ending is Omba. So that's the name of this character, is Gluskomba, the talking person made of talk or the talker. If I went over to uh, our neighbors, uh, the Penobscots in Maine, they would say Al Nabe is a person. Compared to Almomba becomes Almombe. So therefore, Gluskomba becomes. Bluskabe. So we have Bluskabe. And then we have Alma, which is Pasmaquati Malasi, which means a man. So therefore, Bluskomba becomes Bluskabe, becomes Bluskab from Alma. So we see how we get that name. And Migama as well, we have Bluskab. All the same character. Bluskabe was full of magic power, Agua, so it is said. So much power that at one point he decided to shape the human beings. Oh, hey. and Gluskomba knew that the human beings wouldn't be super strong. That human beings would be um, nothing in comparison to some of the animals that he'd see in the forest. Some of these creatures were powerful and huge, and so Gluskomba became concerned, and he decided to have a council. A podawazwi skoda, which literally means it's translated council, but podawaz. Podaba is a whale. Poda is to blow. Uh, and then Squada is fire. Podawazwi Squada is about blowing smoke into the fire, literally. And it's about having a council, a council fire. Uh, so we could probably smoking tobacco. A gift from native people like corn squash and beans to the world. Not always looked at as a gift, but it certainly was and is very sacred to this day. So he decided to have a council, a Podawazwi Squada. And he gathered in front of him, like you're gathered in front of me, all the animals of the great forest. And he asked him a question. What is it that you will do when you see human beings? And the minute he says that word, man, most of the animals, Pulawak, Pulawak Hadith. They ran away. Or they, um, they flew away. Or they, they swam away. They didn't want anything to do with us because why? We would, we would hunt them. And we would, we would fish for them. But there were a few that didn't run. Oh. There were a few that not only didn't they run, they became Musqual da Hadit. They got angry. 
and Blue Skull Ma knew he needed to do something about these ones. He looked at the first <coughs> of these creatures that didn't run. It was Kitsiawasos. Kitsiawasos. I want to get see our source. Uh huh. Get see our source is the great bear. Agamaida, what will you do? He, he said, What will you do when you see the first <clears throat> human beings? And great bear said, <clears throat> I will eat every human being I see, and I'll never get full until I eat every one. Nice. Oh? Hey. Well, who's going back? I got a little worried about that. And he thought, <clears throat> My friend, he looked at that bear, he said, uh, You seem to have some burrs stuck up in your fur. Come here, come here, I have a comb. I'd like to help you with that. And Goose Gomba used one of his combs that he had with him, and he began to comb the hair of that bear. And as he combed its fur, its piasso, that bear, each, each time he stroked its back, that bear got a little smaller. <laughs> and smaller. And smaller. And eventually, Goose Gomba figured he was a good size. It was a black bear, and he, he stopped combing its back, and he said, now what will you do when you see the human beings? And Black Bear looked up at Goose Gomba and saw how much bigger he was and how much smaller that bear had become and said, I'll run away. And so it is to this day that usually that's what happens. Well, there were other animals. And the next one was even bigger than Kitsi Awasos. It was Kitsi Moose. Moose. Yeah, but not just moose. Big moose. Great moose. Yes, Kitsi Moose. And that great moose was really, really moose. Well, Dakla was really angry. And Glus Gomba asked him, what will you do when you see human beings? And Moose said, I'll run through their villages, and I'll smush their wigwam out. I'll smush their homes. I'll throw them up into the air, and I'll spear them with my askanak, with my antlers. Back then, the Moose's antlers were sharp like spears. And Moose stood taller than the greatest longhouses of the Haudenosaunee, of the Iroquois people. This Moose was giant. Well, Goose Gomba said, oh, my friend Moose, don't you know humans, they're going to be just like me. They'll be just as strong as me. So maybe you should test your Malik uh, Sanawongan. You should test your strength. See if you can even push me over. And he held up his hand. And that could see Moose walked over and put its nose right into one of Goose Gomba's hands. And then Goose Gomba held the antlers with his other hand. And he said, Guaguna, push. And that moose pushed. Ho? Oh. Hey. And he pushed again. Ho? Oh. Hey. And he pushed again. Ho? Oh. Hey. And he pushed again. Ho? Oh. Hey. But Goose Gomba never moved. Goose Gomba just stood there. And when he was done pushing, Moose realized he was much smaller than he'd done, been before. He pushed so hard that he'd smushed his own nose right in. His antlers had been smoothed and rounded the way they are today. They look like the shapes, they say, of, of Goose Gomba's hands. And you can see a, a print of his hand on Moose's face. And his back is all scrunched up from pushing so hard because he was so strong that he shrunk down to a more reasonable size. But Moose was pretty smart. He didn't keep pushing. He stopped pushing. And he's still huge, one of the biggest creatures in the forest. Sometimes still angry, but for the most part, realizing how strong we are as humans, Moose keeps his distance from the people. Oh, hey. And there were other animals that didn't run. There was a terrible one called Kitsi. Mikoa. And I don't want you guys to translate that, those who know. Because um, Kitsi Mikoa was so terrifying. The worst creature in all the forest. And Goose Gomba said, Kitsi Mikoa, what will you do? Five minutes. Okay, what will you do when you see human beings? And Kitsi Mikoa said, I will throw, I will pull trees out of the ground and throw them on them. I'll take great boulders and I'll throw them on top of their homes. I'll kill them all and tear them apart. Oh. Nope. Hey. Hey. Well, Luz Gomba looked at this one, could see Mikawa. Has anybody figured out who it is? The great, the mean, the terrible? Squirrel. squirrel. It was Squirrel, but back then Squirrel was as big as this auditorium, which I need to, I need to vacate in five minutes, so we're gonna, I can't tell you all the story. But that, that great big Squirrel, you know, these great big creatures, it's funny, I heard these, as I said, as a kid. This is one of the ones I love. I remember when I went down to some museums in Washington, D.C., and I saw creatures that, in some cases, resembled. Perhaps these are memories of these great rodents and things that lived. But they say once the squirrel was so huge and so mean that Louis Gomba had to pull out his old home again. 
And he said, oh, Nico, uh, come, come, squirrel. You have some burrs in your fur. <laughs> and he began to comb that, that squirrel. And that squirrel was so angry, so muskwagawa, that unlike bear, he just kept on combing and combing, combing and combing until that squirrel fit right into the palm of his hand. And it was still so angry. And I blew a by and said, you'll just have to go as you are. And squirrel ran right up the tree. And if you run into a squirrel in the woods, they'll still throw acorns and sticks down on you and chatter and say, I'll tear you apart, I'll tear you apart. And they'll even try it. They get their hands on it. Their hands on you to scratch you. Squirrels are still pretty angry at us human beings. Oh, okay. luckily they fit the, the palm of our hands. There's just, there were other animals. I was going to tell you one more. There was one more animal who didn't get muskwatahla. He was, uh, he was wigong down. He was happy. So happy that he began to wag his wusogana. A dog. Yeah, it was dog. Dog just sat there, didn't run away, just started wagging his tail. And wusogana said, oh, I'll moose, which means you'll continue to walk with them. Alamus, the one who walks beside human beings and lives with us to this day. And that's where that story ends and my time ends. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you.